Hello, everyone. <laughs> it's great that always so many people are joining to our open lecture series. I see already over 110 people. That's amazing to see. Happy New Year 2021 to everyone. Hope this, this will be a better year for all of us. And uh, yeah, I will just um, quickly introduce myself. I'm Rahel from Excel Bootcamp. Um, I'm always doing the quick introductions for our in, uh, open lecture series. And I just want to remind you that you can also check some of them on our Excel Bootcamp YouTube channel. Um, like for example, the one with Freya Holmer or the one with uh, Microsoft HoloLens with Julia Schwartz or even with Magic Leap. So um, yeah, you're definitely invited to check that out. And um, yeah, as Excel Bootcamp, we are hosting many um, yeah, classes, advanced level and beginner level via AR classes and courses, um, all focused on industry projects and on your portfolio so that you can really learn how to um, yeah, get better, how to create better via AR portfolio projects. And um, our alumni so far are all very happy with us. <laughs> and we are very proud on having achieved that during the last year. And uh, what I want to highlight is that, yeah, even for advanced Unity developers, our courses are bringing very new things to the table. Um, the mentorship is very, very helpful to students and uh, the industry connections as well. And you can see like a lot of our test students' testimonials also on our Excel Bootcamp YouTube channel. And um, our um, students are coming from lots of lots of different companies um, um, from all different kinds of industries. And yeah, if you're taking our courses, um, you will you will be under a good um, yeah under a good network of different students. So this is basically the courses that we are offering right now. Um, next week, the advanced VR interactions class is starting. Um, and yeah, I would like to invite uh, Ferhan from Excel Bootcamp to tell you a little bit more about the courses we are offering very, very soon. Thank you, Rahel. Hello, everyone. Uh, Happy New Year. It is great to see a great crowd this year. So uh, apparently, not only this year, but this uh, next year and this year and even last year, we had a lot of uh, interest to VR and it will never uh, go down. So we are really happy about that. And uh, Roger and Dennis uh, is with, with us, so I will not uh, make uh, take so much of your time. As Rahel mentioned, we have uh, several classes, but uh, today um, maybe I would like to go a little bit uh, through um, our what kind of classes that we are planning for you. Uh, in the next slide, uh, I will show you um, uh, how we are actually creating this um, standalone XR-focused advanced classes. So if you are already building something for Quest, for different standalone uh, devices, we want to make sure that we uh, cover you in um, different kind of aspects. One of them is, of course, creating lifelike interactions which we believe that is very important for, for, the, for the class. And the other part is um, like rendering optimization, because even though these devices are quite powerful right now, we still see that uh, if you want to bring really um, a high quality experience, you have to still um, optimize enough. And we will open the rendering optimization class um, pretty soon in the next few months. And the last one is Unity uh, has new um, entity component system based system, which is called DOTS, data oriented. It is a little bit different mindset than object oriented. And we also uh, prepared this class with Roger. Maybe today uh, is much more on the interactions, but uh, if you have any questions, we are happy to answer that as well. So uh, in the next slide, uh, I can tell you uh, a few things about um, like uh, the each class. Uh, you can just uh, actually check our website to, to see all these advanced classes. And um, advanced VR interactions is the one that is starting pretty soon. Actually, we have only one week left. Next week, uh, it is starting. So I would like to go directly to, to advanced interactions class details. Actually, Roger and Dennis will share more, so I will just and maybe mention a little bit about how does the whole um, masterclass experience look like. So 
This time we have actually um, the class is based on uh, different modules, but we also want to give the opportunity to make this class more accessible. So uh, because of that, we also in the uh, like next slide, you can see that we actually create a recording available option, uh, which is um, actually including different packages, which um, I can share with you. Uh, you have access to Slack, you will have access to assignments. We have a very nice uh, wiki system, uh, knowledge based system that you can actually um, even get the answers before, before even asking to our trainers and mentors. And of course, the project itself, the virtual robotic arm, which you probably see a few um, videos from uh, Dennis and our channels. Uh, so you will get access to the sample codes of this project and you will build the assignment on top of that. In this package, we are targeting more advanced people who, who, who can um, understand most of the topics here and can have a self-paced format. So we just want to make this class as accessible as possible. Um, and we have also for those who wants to even start working with different cohort of uh, like students in the same cohort, we have actually live mentorship and live uh, classes with Roger and Dennis. And in this, uh, as you see on the left in this um, package, we also want to make sure that we provide the solutions of each assignment as long as you attempt it, because for us, you we really want you to, to attempt to the class, uh, to, the, uh, to the assignments, uh, because this class is really uh, challenge you a lot, our assignments from easy, medium, hard, hardest. And um, whenever you are stuck somewhere, we really want to make sure that you are getting the best support possible through our mentors and Dennis and Roger. And um, we have also certificate system in addition to the completion certification, we also want to create some kind of like a um, recognition of your project or your uh, excellence in VR uh, development skills. This is, you can see this as a, some kind of like a master thesis defense that you are actually pitching your project and your skills to our trainers after you graduate from this class. And if you pass this, uh, this uh, pitching process, and you get a an, uh, um, uh, pass from, 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 from our trainers, uh, we will have a special certification and we will have special um, recommendation directly from our trainers. And you are pitching that to our um, actually uh, industry partners as well. So without further ado, actually, I, I would like to just share with you that uh, since we have only a few days left, we want we wanted to provide some um, uh, discount for for this course. Uh, if you are interested, uh, till the end of tomorrow, we are still accepting applications with the code that you are seeing here. And uh, I would like to give the stage to Roger and Dennis because um, they will tell more about the class, and we are also looking forward to hear more about what's happening in Hand Physics Lab. And we would like to also give the opportunity for you to ask any question. So if possible, you can still submit your questions to the Q&A. So hey, Roger, uh, Hello, hope everything is good in 2021. We have new expectations, new announcements, uh, CES started. So I hope it is uh, also exciting for you. Yeah, I mean, 2021 started very similar to 2020 ended. <laughs> but we are very hopeful that it gets all better and more exciting. Definitely on the side of hardware, I think we get now nearly everyone ha can have a quest, which wasn't really the case in 2020. So, you know, we get more yeah. into experiencing for the first time VR, which is always very exciting for us. Yeah, I, I think that uh, there was stock stock problem for those who wants to get quest too, but now it goes back to normal. I hope that uh, people can access to different headsets um as much as possible i mean in our classes we mostly require also quests so um for us it is important to make everyone access to these devices so hey dennis uh, so we would like to hear more about you uh, your different experiments for hand physics lab so would you like to share screen and start uh, and then 
uh, without further ado, we can also take um, questions. I'm pretty sure that there are several questions waiting for us. So you can submit to your questions to the Q&A tab. Uh, if you are submitting on chat, it is difficult for us to, to follow. So if you submit to Q&A chat, Q&A uh, section, it will be great. So stage is yours, Dennis and Roger. Okay, so we prepared a small overview of uh, pushing the boundaries of VR interactions. And maybe a little bit about me and Dennis. Um, we both founded Holonautic a little bit more than two years ago now. And we basically jumped head first into VR um, because once we experienced it for the first time, we couldn't think of doing anything else because we were excited about what it could bring for the future um, because it had so many different aspects and so many new challenges on the table that we just couldn't stop ourselves like experimenting with what is possible in this new domain, uh, domain with so many different changes. Um, so Dennis, maybe introduce yourself a little bit. Your background might be very important for some to know. So hi, everyone. Thanks again for joining. So yeah, as Roger said, uh, we both founded Holland two years ago, and we have um, some part which are with common background and some part which are very different, which helped us to really like put our skill set together to build our experiences. So I have more a background uh, into neuroscience and biotech originally, and then I started to go more in the development and computer science and spatial computing a few years after that. Uh, we were both working in the same company initially, but then we decided to leave and found Holonautic to really jump head, uh, head first into the spatial computing domain because that's really what fascinated us uh, from a long time ago. So yeah, that we really wanted to go in there and experiment with new stuff and really build, build, try to build new experiences that were never made, made up to now. So um, Roger, you wanna quickly talk a bit more, more about yourself or we directly go to the intro? Well, I guess, I mean, it's interesting, you know, always where we came from. So yeah, we worked in the startup and then wanted to create our own after the pre first startup got bought. And my background is first actually in economics, then I transitioned to the more engineering and science side of biotech, and then finally ended up as a computer scientist, um, which is actually quite interesting because what we do currently um, combines a little bit all of it because you need to be aware of the body and how the brain functions as well as being very astute in being able to program and code things in a very highly performed way and economics is always helpful to know what's going on in the market and judge where the whole industry is going um, so we want to provide you a little bit of an overview of hand tracking um, what has been built, what Dennis has, ha has been experimenting with, especially in the last few weeks and months uh, in Hand Physics Lab. And then also we we'll quickly show you what we built for viral, the introduction to the how to use hand tracking in your own application. Um, and then we ended, of course, with many questions, as many as you have. So first, hand tracking. Um, why hand tracking and why we are excited about it or why it basically sparked the interest uh, to create something like Hand Physics Lab. So um, one of the beautiful thing uh, about hand tracking is that you don't need, probably most of you experimented already with hand tracking through Oculus Quest or another device that supports that, but really need, you can really put the headset on your head and you immediately see your hands and you can start interacting with anything. You can even have someone else like a friend or family trying any experience you make and they would immediately interact with anything you, you built without the need that you need to, to give them the controller to explain them, okay, the button is here, so you can grab an object, you need to press that button at that time. No, they just see their hands and they can naturally interact with objects. Either they could be buttons, they could be 3D object or anything you can imagine to put in your app. And that's really what excites us for anything you can do in VR is to really use the intuitiveness and uh, that it can be approached by anyone, even people that never tried VR ever, who just put a headset on and being able to immediately interact with hands. Um, and an approach we really like is to be able to use physics. For any apps we, or most apps we build up to now, we like physics because the beauty of physics, uh, can you go to the next slide, is that we all indirectly know how physics work, even though if we don't like our like, physicists or we know all the equation or how mechanic works, we know, okay, if I push that object, it will behave like this. If I try to grab an object, it will do this, which most of the time, if you usually work with kinematic interaction in VR, you know, the typical ghost approach, like you, you have your hand, you grab an object and it just go through and you know the event, okay, the, the 
and is now grabbing. So it grabs the object, but you don't see your fingers really interacting with that object, which can be sometimes a little bit confusing and like throw you out of the experience. So the immersion is lost. So the, the beauty of that is if you combine the, the, like the simple input system from hand tracking with physics, you can really make way more immersive uh, experiences. And for that, something really interesting is to play with proprioception. It's like, um, like the sixth sense we have that we basically can perceive where our body is in real time, how our finger are configured, more or less where it is without it being fully precise. So it allow yourself, for example, if you have physical constraint uh, in VR and if you push through a wall, you will see that your VR hands will basically be stopped at the wall, uh, even though for real, your hands are a bit further. But because what you see more or less um, fulfills what you expect to happen. So basically your finger to be stopped by that physical object, either it being a wall, a button or something that can move around. If you see that your fingers are actually behaving in the way you expect them to, you have a way better immersion. And uh, the beauty is that you can really play with that because even though if you don't have touch, uh, the, the feeling of touch or haptics, when your brain sees that your fingers are really colliding with a physical object in VR and it reacts properly, you will have that, uh, what you experience that actually, yeah, you have some kind of feeling of touch even though you don't touch anything. That's really some of the few tools you can play with your brain to make it more immersive. So that was basically how HPL started initially where a combination of physics-based interaction with hand tracking seemed to be very promising and a lot of um, users uh, responded very well to that, like being able to live in a world and actually interact with it. And probably some of you have already tried Hand Physics Lab or at least have seen some tweets of it. And now I want to give a little bit of overview of what has been done uh, in the last few weeks and months and what we learned what was really important to have in a hand tracking enabled app. And I think it starts with the stability and safety system, which enabled us to get it more, become it, make it more approachable for a larger variety of users. And before, because Oculus has certain default ways how to handle when it loses tracking of hands, and for HPL, it wasn't ideally seated, suited. But maybe Dennis, you can tell more what exactly the problem was with the default behavior. The, yeah, of course, the, the, the easy solution is just to hide the hands as soon as you know, okay, the tracking is bad, so they just disappear. Like it's the default behavior in the, in the typical Oculus home menu and other headset provider do the same. As soon as the confidence of the finger or hand tracking is bad, they just disappear. So, you know, okay, I need to like put them apart so they reappear. But as soon as you have physics-based interaction, even linked to your whole body, which is also physics-based in a, in a VR app, uh, that could be problematic because if you disable something and you move and then the tracking becomes good again and then you reactivate the hands it could like reappear inside an object or inside the wall and as you know most game engine as uh, soon as you have impossible to fulfill constraint uh, in physics then it start to glitch out uh, you have the typical ragdoll bugs and glitches that can happen so to prevent that uh, here the approach was to never actually disable or hide the hands they're always active so it uses a combination of interpolation, guessing, and locking sometimes the hand to the last known position, which, with, which had really good tracking. And try to make it seamless that you can even like put one hand in front of the other and it continues and interpolate where it more or less the, the position is guessed. So you, the, the user always know, okay, as soon as my hand should run, I should try to fix it by putting my hands away, but they never disappear. So you never have the risk that you can at any moment like glitch with the physics or any kind of other object or even put one hand through the other because that would create any, many problems in an app which has a lot of physics based interactions. Yeah, and I think especially like the, the red tinting which you see on the hands because now you get, um, actually it's a long time you get the informational confident intervals on each part of the hand, also the fingers, and actually showing that to the end user, like what is currently badly tracked, help them a lot to adapt to the hand tracking limitations which you currently have. Because if you don't communicate it to the end user with some kind of indication directly on the hand models, they might not be aware of that they currently have a pose with their hand, which the tracking technology is not yet capable of handling very well. And so giving more visual feedback is definitely helpful and allow many more people to um, solve and play with the experience without getting too frustrated about the hand tracking capabilities which we have at the current time. 
and so, the next uh, feature or addition, addition, I think, is very exciting because it goes a little bit in anatomy. But please explain what yeah. was the main challenge. So the, the first iteration only had um, like the hand and the finger physics. So you could do a lot of with your hands, but it wasn't sometimes feeling fully realistic or like really that it was like an extension of your body real hands because sometimes they were too strong or sometimes it was not really like um, behaving the way, the way you would expect if you would press against the wall. But now uh, there is wrist and arm physics, which add that additional layer of constraints and uh, like resistance. So now if you push against a wall, you will see that your wrist will really behave correctly because then you have also the rest of your arm, which is purely computed using inverse kinematics. So it allows you to guess more or less where your arm is, but then it will also apply some forces and constraint on the wrist and on the fingers, which will then make the whole thing behave a little bit more realistic. Uh, and of course, to have the visual arms, uh, especially with the skeleton move in a realistic way, there were several challenges that appeared. Um, the main one was, of course, the visual of the forearm because um, it behaves in a really interesting manner because to be able to do really that twisting uh, behavior of the forearm, uh, because we have two bones, the ulnar and the radius, and they really need to flip on top of each other, which is something uh, most people are not even uh, aware of, but it really behaves in a, they really switch on top of another. So that was a quite challenging way to make that look and feel correct, to make it behave realistically that the, the IK would fit with the physics and that the two bones would realistically move and be attached correctly to the wrist without creating any problem with the physics. So that was the main challenge. Uh, and the second one was, of course, to always try to never uh, have the arm in preventing the user to do what they want because sometimes, because it's guessing where the arm should be. So sometimes they can really be, really, really be in a bad position or preventing the user to do what they want. So also that needed to be taken into account to prevent that, that it really makes the experience less good and only make it better. Otherwise there would not really be any reason to have arm physics in that app. And that allowed also new features to be shown. We have sort of a little glimpse of where it helped actually to create new kinds of experiences for the player in the end. Um, but rope physics, I think rope physics is always something everyone wants and is really hard to achieve in a performant way, especially on mobile devices. Um, and there are asset store plugins uh, which do um, rope physics, but actually none of them were performant enough for us to use in HPL. And maybe go a little bit into detail how those rope physics actually work and how they got constructed. So yeah, in, in that case, we really, uh, had to make a completely new system because as soon as you can enforce object really using forces, you can have in many cases that one rope would just go through another. If you just take into account the, like if you want that, that rope to be able to nicely lay on another object, then it works fine. But as soon as you really want to have strong constraint, because the, the whole point of adding rope physics in hand physics lab was to add other experiences and other potential puzzles where you needed to solve some stuff, untwist a node or really like pull an object really hard on the rope and it should resist and not glitch out. So yeah, the, the, the system needed to be built that it can really be very uh, stable and resistant for any kind of constraint you apply on it. So even if you grab it with multiple fingers and twist it or pull it really hard, it should really keep the, the consistency of the, the rope physics you want to play with while being performant. That was is also one of the major Of course, one of the main challenges is that it needs to work on the Quest 1 as well. Mm -hmm. So unfortunately, what you see in that video with three ropes, that was a little bit too much for the Quest 1. So the limit uh, was to have full finger and hand physics and as well as two of those ropes. Then on Quest 1, it was working quite in a performant manner. And here is one of the very quirky experiences um, which uh, tries to similar bounce it like viscosity and forces because there is actually no fluid physics uh, inside of Unity by default. So we, if you want to have anything simulating fluids, you have actually to build your own system from scratch. Um, and it's a little bit challenging, especially because the API doesn't provide you a lot of information um, because you actually don't get access to the source code of physics directly for Unity. It's like on a higher level of, of subtraction. So maybe can you go a little bit into detail what techniques used to simulate like balance forces and viscosity um, to make it work in HPL. 
So yeah, in that case, what you see here, uh, the, the liquid is not really simulated. It's like a medium which acts on anything you put in there. So if you throw a cube in there, it would have full viscosity, then depending on if it's water or jelly, it will like move in slower. And it also simulates the buoyancy of what you put in there. So it was interesting to play with that with uh, the fingers and the hands. So you could really behave, uh, like see that the behavior of the hands would uh, like act if you put it in water, it really acts the way you would expect. You have a slight resistance, you can move around and it's not too annoying. But if you put in jelly, you can, really feel that it, there is more resistance and that the, the, the viscosity really acts on your finger. So basically, it's just a medium, like a, like a 3D volume, where as soon as any object enters it, it will be constrained based on the property of that liquid. But the liquid itself is not simulated. So you, you will not see waves or you will not be able to change the volume of the liquid, because that would, of course, not be possible to simulate such a, such a system on a mobile device like the Quest. So that was the, the main limitation, but uh, just using those mechanics, a lot of cool experiences and puzzle um, could be built because it was it showed really interesting potential. So that's something that will be iterated on because being able to simulate a liquid medium was very interesting. And yeah, this one is actually, it. it's something which I think is a little bit new. That's something which you cannot actually have in the real world, like you, cannot, unless you do very complicated and probably um, not really legal operations on the brain, you cannot have those kind of brain tricks. Um, and maybe it's hard to see on the video, but here actually the hands are switched. So your left hand controls the visual right hand, which you see in the, in the experiment itself, um, which actually is very fascinating. And we, we haven't had enough um, of, of the users tried and tested out to get enough feedback, but for me, it was easier to do after a while. You get actually used to it relatively well. Um, and it's it's a very weird experience. How was it was for you, Dennis, when you first like experimented with that? So yeah, it was very interesting because you really need to think with both hands and both arms at the same time because the, the position of the hand is still correct. It's following the, the where the hand is. Like if you move a right hand, the right hand moves. But the only thing which is mirrored here is the fingers. So basically it acts as a, like an excavator arm where you need to think differently when you want to pinch an, or act on an object. So that was very interesting. Of course, an even further experience would be to completely mirror the two arms, the two finger, the, all the fingers. So basically your full body is mirrored. That would be an addition on that. But that's something really cool you can do in VR is you can really play and trick your brain. The, the detachable hands was another example made a long time ago that you can really see what, what happens if you really detach or mirror or reverse some part of your body and see, okay, how can I control that? Because you still have full control on it, but it doesn't really behave the way you do it in real life. So you can really experience with that. And I think that one, um, especially when it got shared on social media, got a lot of attention. Um, no kitties were actually harmed during the experimentation, but um, that was the first time an experiment was done with an animated object which looked like something which is alive and reacts to your hand touching it. And of course, here we unfortunately don't have any sound, but of course the cat is um, also acoustically reacting uh, to your interactions with it. And it's a very basic for the moment. It can only be petted a little bit and play with it. Um, but we saw nearly everyone reacted very emotionally when they had a cat which they could pet, um, which reacted on, in, in a physics-based manner, nearly no one just le was left cold by the cat and very few were actually trying to be aggressive to the cat. Most of them tried to be caring and treated like a real world animal, which was very surprising to see. Um, but maybe we can also talk about the challenges of making a physics-based um, animal with animations work um, inside of Unity. Yeah, the, the, the complicated part here is to, you really need to have all the systems working together in order to have the animation combined with the physics, with the interaction and the smart behavior. So this part uses a tool, maybe some of you heard about Puppet Master, which is an awesome tool on Unity, which allows really to merge uh, an animated um, character with physics. And that really allows to really merge uh, the, 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 the animation, which is fully scripted with the physics-based reaction. And on top of that, uh, then an interaction layer can be added. So you can really make the, the cat behave the way you want. As soon as you approach it, it will 
uh, trigger a specific event and uh, really behave as if you were a really human interacting with a real cat and you can add all that on top to make it re uh, really behave like a real cat that you can really have that cat petting experience in VR, which was something really cool to do at the beginning. Yeah, and I think still a lot of people want to see more of the cat interactions and being able to play with it. And um, that's probably coming at some point. Um, and one of the main things um, up to now, HPL was mainly a sandbox where you could just experience how hand tracking and physics work together. Um, but we also saw that some users feel a little bit lost if you have so many uh, possibilities, but there's no guidance. So um, there's actually, we are now hard at work to make interesting puzzles with the existing mechanics of the physics and the hand tracking. And maybe you can tell a bit more, uh, what is the main goal on those puzzles? So, yeah, it was interesting to see that user in general are way more engaged as soon as you give them a task to do. Sandbox experiments are really nice, but only a niche of people really like sandbox. But as soon as you give people a task to accomplish, that you don't really need to explain what they need to do, but you put them in front of the task and it's really almost immediately, okay, I need to do that. I need to grab that cube, put it there. I need to use, use that object to unlock this object. So yeah, with the, 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 the engine from Hand Physics Lab now, there is a possibility, the possibilities to make like hundreds of puzzles, hundreds of interaction. And uh, the goal is to really make simple but satisfying little experience you can do. And you always have a feeling of accomplishment and it's always fun. Every experience, the, the goal is to have every experience really different from one another and always fun and, and playful that you can play with that part. So yeah, from anything you can imagine. So from light bulb, electricity, plugging cables together, really using all the, the physics shown in the previous slides to really build those kind of interactive puzzle of stuff that could mimic reality or extend reality to really give you superpowers like telekinesis, like force fields, like magnetic powers, anything they imagine that will be added in this puzzle that will make their way in the in the final version of the game. Yeah, and I think especially the, the center puzzle where you actually are physically constrained with your arms. Um, I was first very worried if it doesn't feel good because we cannot track the perfect position of the arm. It's all a guesstimation, but um, through multiple tests, we saw that it actually works, like the brain just adapts and you're aware that you're constrained and you try to move your hand, even if it's not exactly the position. So it perfectly worked and it gives actually a very satisfying feeling to go into a tube and be able to grab those cubes um, and try to get them out. And we had very good feedback on that um, and hope that more puzzles like that will be added um, before the actual official release. Um, and the viral project, uh, because we got asked last year plenty of times, like, how do you get started with hand tracking or with how do you implement such intuitive interactions in my application? We need to, we have some client projects or we need to up our game on the interaction design. And there is not really a lot of classes out there which focus on interactive design, especially with hand tracking. So we created the viral project, which um, is basically um, a class where we teach uh, from how to use hand tracking to do interactions. And it starts with a simple locomotion because hand tracking um, has not the same capabilities as controllers. You have less options. You have to be careful how to use them. So we start with simple teleportation. Then we go into advanced UI, kinematic UIs. And then we go further and further also in the physics space part where we have um, a robotic arm which uses inverse kinematics and can be controlled through a hologram, as well as joysticks, buttons, et cetera. And we explore multiple options to build an interactive uh, UX and UI experience inside the viral project. And we also start, of course, with the kinematic interactions that well, probably most of you know, which you also have in the Oculus menu, at least on the desktop version, where you grab something and it basically gets attached to your hand, but it doesn't interact with the rest of the world. And then we go further and add fully physics-based interactions uh, where you can have multiple rigid bodies combined and they collide also with the world and you can basically approach something which is in on the on in the direction of what the hand physics lab is doing with interactive controls and also snapping of hands to controllers etc so yeah the, the whole goal of the project was to really build the whole interaction framework uh, every week for the class but it all builds uh, in the end you have a full project which 
uh, like focused around being able to interact with that robotic arm. So it goes from inverse kinematics, how you can build that robotic arm, how you can make it interactive, how you can make it smart, that you can control it, but uh, you can also uh, like uh, automatically make him go to targets and it will bring it back to you. The whole goal is was to make this class uh, covering every aspect we wanted to teach in that class uh, through all the different way you can make interaction system with hand tracking. But in the end, you have a concrete example. In that case, it's the industrial case of being able to interact and control the, the robotic arm. Um, we also, uh, we had, now we have given the class more, um, already more than once and we are always fascinated and always like to share a little bit what students have been able to accomplish either during the class or right after the class and what they shared afterwards with us. Um, so we have the Springified Mesh. That is actually a very interesting uh, implementation from ION, which was done. Um, it actually uses the dots uh, and burst system to be able to get a performance where you can have a sphere which reacts nearly like water running on the quest um, at you know full frame rate, which is usually very hard to do. And this one actually uses the burst compiler to get out the maximum performance to be able to have any mesh basically transferred into um, those little spheres which you then can interact with and deform and that they react nearly like liquids. Um, and we also had a domino simulator being built uh, for one of the end projects uh, from Manuela where, you know, as, unfortunately we don't have the sound because the sound was extremely satisfying in this application. That shows how important it is to get really good sound effects. When you touch those dominoes, they sounded really like real dominoes. It was so satisfying to play with that. Roger, uh, actually, Manuela is right here with us. So I don't know if she wants to make the sound effects or she wants to explain. <laughs> Manuela, do, would you like to say something or should we explain? Should we give the credit to you and explain? I don't know if you, you can hear us. I think we can hear you. Would you like to explain? Oh yeah, can you hear me now? Yes, yes, yes. yes. Oh great. Yeah, I mean it was just like a very small project I made on the weekends because like the course was very extensive and intensive. <laughs> So there's not so much into it, but, um, um, and the sound effects are like f more than 50% of the experience, but um, yeah, um, it's just like a very small domino game. And it's interesting that even if the physics are not real, so you can like put your hands inside a table and um, you can push the dominoes from under the table and, and stuff like that, it's, it still makes fun. And that's, that's interesting that with, even if you don't have like the perfect physics, it's kind of, it makes fun to play around with your hands. And it's, it's such a different thing and to experiment uh, with that. Yeah. It's a lot of fun as a developer right now. Perfect. Yeah, and I think this one showcases so well how important uh, audible feedback is. Unfortunately, we cannot hear it here, but I think we have some Twitter posts or somewhere where we actually, you can hear the audio because I think it's so important because audible feedback, especially if you don't have happy feedback, but audio can actually help a lot to immerse the user. So always pay really good attention and choose the right sound effects to get the user um, to the level of immersion which you want. Um, and then we had two other uh, projects. One was to someone, ta uh, Ross tried to tackle the challenge of uh, implementing uh, a gun Bit, which you can shoot with hand tracking because the main problem is that it's um, you have if you hold the gun too far away like the tracking is relatively poor if you stretch out your arm or the index finger is, ba is badly tracked if you hold the arm like completely in front of you it cannot really detect that so Ross tried to approach this problem by having a different type of mechanism where you can use both hands to actually shoot little balls um, around the scene and we're just fascinated that someone went completely in a different direction and tried to um, you know, tackle that problem of the, the lack of being able to have a trigger button with hand tracking and how to try to solve it in an interesting way. And we also had, um, from them we had a dentist simulator, which already used the, uh, the knowledge he gained during the class to use hand tracking to create a simulation for uh, dentist training to get actually a specific 
um, type of operation to get better precision and know what you do wrong and follow the correct steps. Uh, Utan is also here. I don't know if he can hear us, but I think. Um... Can you guys hear me? Yes. 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 Awesome. Great. So um, thank you, Roger and uh, Dennis and Farhan for uh, the kind intro. Um, so quickly, this project is done in collaboration with uh, New York University College of Dentistry. Um, we are using uh, training modules to teach anesthesia techniques to D2 and D3 students who are currently uh, preclinical, um, who are in the preclinical study. Um, and I got an opportunity to develop some of these um, training modules. And I was lucky that the timing for this development and my uh, master class with XR Bootcamp uh, were very much aligned. And I was able to implement some of the things that I learned in the class. For example, the heads up display that you see here is actually implemented um, through the technique um, that I learned in the class um, by splitting um, the vertical and horizontal positions and how to smoothly um, animate it to the head position but also have an offset so that it's not just like standing right in front of you, but at the corner of your eye. Um, and coming to how the syringe um, is actually constrained once it enters the cheek. So that's actually an interesting constraint uh, because uh, even for dentists, when they put the hand in mid air, uh, it kind of like shivers a little bit, but once it enters like a soft tissue, um, it kind of constrained and that makes it easier for them to deliver the anesthesia in a specific location. So that constraint, again, like I learned through the XR Bootcamp class um, uh, with like uh, rigid bodies and bones. Um, in this particular example, I have used uh, like simpler constraints, but actually um, there is also like another uh, situation in this module where I have used like, you know, bones and I have used um, sort of like, you know, making the joint and detaching the joint kind of. So I would say I'm lucky that you know, I was given an opportunity to be a part of this bootcamp, but also this very interesting project. One one thing that I would like to uh, maybe share uh, to 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 give you a better understanding the condition of the students. Most of our students have full time jobs, and every week they have to finish the uh, assignments from easy, medium, hard, hardest. And on top of that, for example, we just I mean uh, our last cohort just graduated. Uh, a few weeks ago, so uh, right before the holiday season, and they, they actually finished that inside the class. So I couldn't imagine like in eight weeks in this kind of a tight schedule that they come to that point. In eight months, we, we really would like to see uh, the progress together. Maybe in the next sessions, uh, Utam, we would like to hear more about the progress uh, because apparently, like I also talked with several um, uh, institutions and companies, the dentistry, like all these um, simulations are quite important, especially due to the lockdown. Of course, mixed reality is also an option, but since people have to study from their home, I think it's a good, uh, at least alternative or a temporary solution that they can actually uh, use it and continue to their education, at least for this period. So thank you for, for bringing this together. Looking forward to have more like uh, the, the newer versions as well, Utam. Definitely. I think the phase two of this project is to actually implement some kind of haptics. Currently, we are using the, the limited vibrational um, haptic feedback for Oculus controllers, but we are in talks with a couple of haptic-based uh, companies uh, from UK as well as France um, to see if we can incorporate a, a stylus-based haptic device or maybe even UltraLeap's uh, haptic board. So more updates are to come in 2021. Perfect, perfect. Awesome. Great. Thank you, Tom. Yeah, thank you, everyone. And yeah, basically that concludes what we have prepared for today. But of course, we are very open for additional questions. Um, anything related to either the class, the hand physics lab itself, or in general, unity and physics-based um, interactions or performance problems. Um, please shoot the head and let us know. Uh, I think we have already seven questions on the Q&A. Maybe you can also go ahead. In the meantime, I, I also would like to inform everyone that uh, we may need to finish this session maybe in the next 10, 15 minutes, but we will continue with the Discord networking party, uh, which we will continue the discussion and we will get to know each other much better. Um, 
uh, yeah, I our team already shared the the Discord um, invite. Uh, another thing is we can also, if you really would like to ask in person, uh, we can also add you as a panelist instead of uh, submitting your question. Feel free to join to the discussion. So uh, let's let's start from the open questions here. Um, Maybe Roger, would you like um, to start? Yeah, we can start just from top to bottom. Um, yeah. What are our thoughts on, in terms of haptics in the context, context of hand tracking? Um, I mean, I fully agree that it would be really great to have haptics with hand tracking, but um, there's also something to say about the, fees of, to the ease of use of having not to put on any gloves or any additional device to be able to go into an experience. And I think, um, even simple haptic feedbacks with a wristband or something like that would already add a lot to the to the possibilities of what we have as developers to provide feedback uh, to the end users. But uh, we also, if the more accurate like haptic feedback we have with very extremely cool gloves which are currently existing out there, the more it also is a, a hurdle to get into the experience and use it every day. So we always have to make a compromise and it depends on what is the most important. And as Dennis um, explained, like if you have the visual feedback, sometimes it can even overshadow the, the haptic feedback, which needed certainly always helps and adds something, but also the visual feedback with um, bringing something close to reality can actually also provide some sense of feedback. We had um, Norman von Tested actually try out HPL in an early stage and he, like imagine that things actually were there, which provided haptic feedback, which weren't actually possible. So tricking the brain a little bit and having something which the user is immersed can also trigger some kind of a sense of haptic feedback. There's also some experimentations going on with sound as haptic feedback, um, but we haven't seen an easy to use, very well-made haptic feedback, which works on one of the you know widely available headsets yet in combination with hand tracking. Dennis, have have you read anything new and recently? Well, there is a um, leap, uh, ultra leap, which developed the yeah. ultra haptics tool. Uh, of course, for that you need to have that table or the the, the the technology they use in front of you that basically make the make vibration into the air that focuses a specific specific point and helps you to get some haptic feedbacks on your fingers. Uh, but that's probably not something that's going to be widely available for consumers. But they they already will plan to use that. Or machines or like some typical distance touch screen but yeah that's something really interesting that could be done but being able to have uh, haptics directly on your fingers without any additional device that's currently not possible sadly but like roger said being having a wristband which just makes the, the wrist vibrate could already be something really useful i don't know how good that would feel if look you touch an object just with the tip of your finger and your wrist vibrates maybe that could create something uh, very interesting especially if it's a very slight vibration maybe uh, they could even orient where the vibration should be uh, in the structure of your hand to make you really feel okay i'm touching that object um but that's something to explore so we, we didn't have the, the occasion to explore up to now but that's something really interesting to to know for the future what would be I, possible yeah i think one of the best things microsoft Hololens has done at least from from a ux perspective is like the windows button is on your own wrist so you tap basically yourself and there you get the haptic feedback and that feels really amazing if you have any time a technology which can simulate something like that type of feedback, it would be perfect. But we are currently not there yet. Um, um, uh, Roger, actually, Cyril uh, Tushi, um, hello, Cyril. Uh, we we he, she, he already asked about ultra haptics at the end. Maybe you can check. And he has one more question. I just want to uh, in, interfere. Maybe you can answer his question in terms of the virtual assets, yeah. virtual skin over tables. Uh, the, yeah, the combination of real world objects with virtual objects goes in the same direction as what Microsoft did for the Windows Home button. Um, just there, you have to, of course, map the real environment. And we already have, a bit the HoloLens, for example, we already have devices which can map the real world nearly in real time, or at least very, very quickly. Um, and you could basically build a geometry on that and then put on virtual objects on top of it that you have the capability oculus quest actually maps certain points already in your environment uh, like if you have it where you when you create the boundaries and you have a chair inside your player it actually shows up that it detects it 
Um, but I don't think we have access, as far as I know, we don't have access to that API that we could build, um, you know, some like some dynamically generated meshes or <laughs> objects based on the real world, at least on the quest. In, in AR, those things are made more likely to be possible because it needs to take in the real world information for the occlusion calling and all of that, which we need to place objects. And otherwise we can go to the next question um, about starting from completely from scratch with very limited time budget, uh, but having an Oculus Quest 1, uh, how much time before being able to create my own hand tracking basic demo? I mean, we should answer that. Are you taking the master class and then after that or <laughs> without that? Let's say you have never used Unity before and have never programmed anything and you just got a Quest 1 and open Unity for the first time. I think it will take you a few years to to really build something more than just, you know, opening the demo scene and showing that to someone. Because you need to at least at the moment, I think you need to have some coding knowledge or at least have someone in your team which is capable of programming. Um, you need to learn Unity and 3D math and all of it. So it, I think if you start with absolutely no background in development of anything, it will take you a while to get there. Um, but we are working on creating classes which bring you absolutely from zero knowledge or close to zero knowledge to uh, someone which can be like a professional in the industry. But we, are, we don't have the class available yet. But if you're interested in that, um, yeah, exactly. Zero to hero kind of style where we bring you the good practices, the learning how to build grid architectures and, you know, learn the way to live in the new world with, uh, you know, XR and spatial computing, which adds a whole new paradigm shift of what you need to think about, what you need to care about. And you're working on that, but it's not ready yet. This class is definitely not for the for the faint of heart, which when they open a text file, they code in it, they lose their consciences. So we there definitely you have to be capable of programming and actually enjoy programming. I think then the viral project will be good for you. But if you do not want to touch any code, I think you will not be happy in the class, to be honest. Um, for uh, explanations and videos, uh, they're mostly about VR. In some cases, interactions with real steering wheel automotive industry, it's necessary to make the real uh, object precise. It will XR topic covered in the class as well. So we didn't, in the hand interaction class, we don't cover um, anything else than VR. Uh, we didn't go into the AR topic. Um, one of the main reasons is that the, the one of the most successful headsets in the AR um, area is still uh, Microsoft HoloLens, which is very short um, on stock. So you cannot get it even if you know people at Microsoft, it's very hard to actually get a device. Um, so we couldn't create the class for this audience because it's still very, very few who can actually access the device. And if you try to learn something about using the HoloLens with never being able to actually wear it or actually experiment with it and only use the emulator, you will never understand what the complexities are and how it works. So that is not currently available. We, as soon as an AR headset is widely available, we probably will make a class for it to teach what the limitations are or the benefits and how you can use AR in a very good way in the industry. Just currently the, the pool size is not big enough that we can, we also cannot have any special connections that we could provide, uh, you know, a headset for taking the class or anything similar because they're just too limitedly available. But the headset itself has very good capabilities and it's very awesome to use, but yeah, the, just the availability is way too low. One question that I would like to ask, if you get this class, uh, would it be helpful on any of your Unity-based XR projects? Or is there yeah. anything that you can tell? So for us, at least from what we can tell up to now, like VR is, it's already hard to go from, you know, 2D web development to, to VR development where you have all the 3D stuff, etc. And I think VR is the first step and AR is even uh, on many portions like even more complex because you have to take the real world into account and you have to often dynamically generate things because you have to adapt it to the real world so you already have you have exactly the same complex in terms of understanding the three-dimensional world um in in vr applications and ar adds just another layer to it so it's always good to actually start already with vr because the development tools are very well uh, refined now you can you know directly click play in unity and test it in the headset like the iteration times are really fast and it gives you all the important things to understand how hand tracking and um, you know, X spatial computing development needs to be done. 
and then later on you can basically transfer many of those knowledge and things you learn directly to the AR um, domain afterwards, at least in my opinion. Dennis, what do you think? Um, I think, yeah, you covered it pretty well. Starting with VR before jumping into AR, especially if you want to work with hand tracking interaction is definitely the right way to go. Because currently developing for AR hand tracking, I think uh, most devices don't even support that you can directly play your application directly on your computer in the Unity editor. So you need, uh, Oculus supports that in a really good way. So you can really fast iterate uh, any kind of interaction you implement. You can easily play in the editor. You can just have a request using uh, Oculus Link and you can immediately test your app, which is really valuable uh, if you want to experiment with a new interaction system and you want to iterate quite fast. Otherwise, every time you want to make a build and you need to test and yeah. So starting with VR for hand tracking is definitely the way to go. At least that's what we can advise. It really allows you to iterate fast. Um, have you any idea why hand tracking isn't activated in the most uh, in most games or experiences? Uh, there, there are for Quest only a few, like the line and maybe some others. And yeah, the main reason why it's not um, active for most experiences because it's not that easy to make your game work with the limitations of how hand tracking currently is. Like you have to probably have to design an application specifically for hand tracking or have the interactions be really suitable for hand tracking. Most of them are like, for example, Beat Saber, you could not play with hand tracking. It just would be absolutely impossible. Uh, the same goes for um, Until You Fall or, uh, you know, Super Hot, maybe to some degree, but it would still be quite the challenge, I think. Super Hot would be maybe the most likely to be able to be ported, but uh, there's just like, there's a lot of limitations still currently on the hand tracking. And that's why most experiences don't allow you to just use the hands. Uh, I think the general rule would yeah. be any any game or application where you are under a lot of pressure, yeah. don't use hand tracking because you, <laughs> if you need to be fastly responsive, like shoot guns or fight, hand tracking is currently not ready. So yeah, yeah most games, which is about it's about fighting or rhythm games or Beat Saber, that you cannot use hand tracking because it's way too, it's not reli reliable that you can basically do everything in a fast way. I think the, the, the few games that supports it are more like the sandboxy, playful games like uh, Job Simulator, like uh, Walls of the Wizard, which actually was built for hand tracking. Those, of course, you can make work with hand tracking because it's mostly a, a, a nice experience, but it's not really challenging or it's not really like uh, competitive. So for that, hand tracking works quite well, but most games which are competitive and fast paced, you currently cannot use hand tracking. And if the class or probably if the learnings which uh, we have gathered can be also used for or implemented in AR. And I think many things you could probably directly port into the AR realm. Um, of course, you have to uh, adhere to the limitations. Uh, hand tracking usually in AR, at least on the whole headsets we tested, is not as wide as, for example, for the Oculus Quest. The Oculus Quest, you have quite a wide range of where your hands get tracked. So you have to, of course, learn like the, the specifics and limitations of AR of the AR headsets you're working in. But uh, for the UI interactions and also the physics-based grabbing, all of that, many of the things can be ported. There is one major uh, problem currently. You see your real hands. So we, for in HPL, it's a lot used that you have a certain delay between where your real hand is and where the virtual hand is because you don't see your real hand, that delay to make the physics fully work um, is not that perceivable. But in AR, you would actually see your real hands and that could lead to a little bit of less pleasant experience. And there are working on potentially like occluding your real hands, but currently the performance of the devices is not there yet, that you could have your real hands interacting with virtual objects, basically masked by some virtual hands which basically are maybe a little bit delayed, but you will not notice it as much if you don't see your real hands. But the performance currently is not there. If you activate it, it's, it gets really poor. Dennis, what do you think on AR and the viral project? Uh, well, for the viral project, it could actually work. Uh, most of the interaction, uh, because uh, the hands are always fully kinematic, of course, they can grab and interact with object in a physicist manner up to some level. But the whole project could be adapted to AR. That would not be a problem. And we have a little bit more technical questions, which we always love. Um, 
how you deal with the absence of non-convex colliders. Um, I hope everyone knows what a non-convex collider is. So basically you cannot have any shape of a collider which has a hole in it. So it needs to be completely closed. Um, and how did we deal with that with, you know, implementing, for example, the mark or similar objects which seem to have a hole when we cannot have non-convex colliders? Um. Well, you, you can have a non-convex collider, but only for collider which are static. Uh, that's, I think it was supported initially in the physics, uh, physics engine from Unity, but they removed that at some point because it was really creating too many problems. So the, the, the way to deal with that is you need to create compound colliders, which is basically a combination of uh, several convex collider or just usually just use primitive colliders to build then your shape out of multiple colliders and then you can use then your whole rigid body will be non-convex because it's made out of multiple uh, convex, um, usually primitive colliders. So in that way, you can really make objects which have a hole like a container, like a cup, like uh, anything which is not convex. Um, are the features like the cat and all the other things we have shown today all already available on the SideQuest version? No, not yet. Uh, <laughs> probably in the next update or in the final release. Um, how do you get one of your cool t-shirts? <laughs> I hope you talk about these. Um, we actually just made them for ourselves, like just because we, we thought we had to get some t-shirts. It's like some merchandise which we need. Um, we can make them available for authors, of course, if you think, if you like them. Um, we were even discussing if you should make some hand tracking focused t-shirts with some yeah. designs. Um, we would actually love to have some community feedback. If you like some of those t-shirts and the designs we have been working on, um, we would love to make them available. Uh, we can afterwards maybe share it like in the, you know, on the Discord and, yeah. and you know, just let us know if you want. We definitely want to pro uh, provide you with any kind of gadgets which you want to, to try at home. I wish we can ask Freya to create that 3D, um, you know, how is it called, Dennis? The free access gizmo? That one yeah, really printed. I think every developer should have one at home and play around when they have to work with the complex like math of orientation and in which direction goes and like left-handed, right-handed, you know, systems. Um, I hope we could have those things available because I think some of those okay. things are very- just, just to know which axis is which color, having that as a little object in front of you while you develop is always practical because even after two years and a half, I still don't know which color <laughs> is which axis. <laughs> <laughs> Even though there are multiple tricks to, to remember, like RGB is XYZ, but you always need to look it up. Okay, what color is what axis? So having a little thing in front of you as an object would be nice. Confessions from Dennis. <laughs> <laughs> okay, we have to a little bit uh, wrap up because, uh, I mean, we will continue on Discord anyways, but I just want to make sure that we cover as many questions as possible. Um, what, shall we go to questions just? Um, yeah. Maybe pick a few. Yeah, I mean, uh, just uh, like you can, I mean, AR, we answered that. Um, Okay, one question was if you ever had used like a Zen set mini camera or uh, lead motion or maybe other devices than the Oculus Quest to maybe do hand tracking or a similar experience. So uh, we have used the lead motion and others. We mainly focused on the Quest because it's the most easily and widely available, easy to set up. But those other ultra haptics, um, etc., they have also very capable devices which have. In some areas, they're better. In some areas, they're a little bit worse than the Oculus Quest hand tracking. But it's not that we have found one device like which beats everyone else in every category. So the Quest 2 hand tracking is extremely good already. Of course, not as good as they showcased in their current research um, paper, which has absolutely phenomenal hand tracking um, there, which we'll probably see in the next five to 10 years, hopefully at some point, with skin deformations and everything working. But yeah, the Quest 2's hand tracking capabilities are already very good. and we, every update in, in my opinion gets uh, better. It just gets more and more convenient. I think if you want to have an all-in-one device, like at the low cost, it's probably a good entry point with the Quest 2 if you can live with the Facebook account requirement. But like for, if you look at the whole price, 
to, to get something where you can develop for PC, you can develop for mobile VR, as well as getting uh, some experience in hand tracking is probably a very good starting point if you are curious into the spatial computing domain and see how what you could do with it. Um, I think that's a, at the moment, I would say it's one of the best entry devices which you can get your hands on. Um, but of course, others have uh, better, you know, better audio systems, uh, more comfortable um, headsets, etc. exist with HV right, uh, right preverb, etc. So they're all really good headsets, but the Quest is probably one of the best entry level devices um, for getting your hands wet into development. Um, Um, do you try simulate the grip with hand tracking? So how firmly or loosely I'm holding or squeezing up. So if he, like, if you build a hand tracking application, there's in the API that is currently, as far as I remember, not uh, a way where it says you grabbed something or you didn't grab something. Um, so you basically have to build that on your own. And we do that in the viral project where we basically use the geometry, like the, we get the tracking points and the deformation of the transforms. We use that data to define when you grab something. And then it's in HPL, you even have a system where you can define how hard you have to grab something until it snaps into your hand, right? Yeah, you can really extend then yeah, your own system up to even define how many fingers needs to be need to be bent to be able to grab an object. Like if you want to grab a pen, for example, you would only need to grab with two or three fingers and it's enough to snap the object. But then if you want to firmly grab like an apple or a sphere or a smaller object, then yeah, you can. You, you have really full freedom because you get all the, the raw data from the fingers, so you can define yourself how many fingers need to be bent, to what amount, uh, how, which part of the bone of each finger needs to be bent that it's registered as a grabbing event from a specific object. So yeah, that you need to build on your own, and that's, it's not provided by Oculus yet. Maybe they will add that in the next update for the API. Uh, I, yeah, you have, full, you have full freedom. I, I also add uh, Luca Mephisto's uh, hand tracking pose, uh, posing um, uh, Git version. So if you would like to check, I send the Twitter link as well. I think it's pretty good that you can actually use the predefined grab uh, pose. Okay, we take one last question. Um, I think it's an important one. Uh, what if we use the new XR input system from Unity? Um, or if you use the Oculus integration. And for viral, as well as in hand physics lab, um, the Oculus integration is currently used. Uh, the main reason is that hand tracking support, we see that some hand tracking support is there with the uh, new um, Unity XR plugin, uh, but the Oculus one gives you a high iteration and it's currently like, you can always get a little bit more benefit if you go vendor specific uh, because they're fast and iterating and you get um, more direct access uh, than until the general solution comes out. For controller inputs, I would definitely suggest try to use the XR input package. That works really well and has been well defined because hand track uh, controller tracking has been out for quite a few years and they could standardize it very well. For hand tracking, we currently focused on the Oculus integration just because of ease of use and the more standardized API. And when we actually developed it, uh, the XR input had no hand tracking features at all in it. Now, I, there seem to be some features supported, but we're not sure how stable it is and how well developed it already is. That's why we go with the Oculus integration. So um, uh, we are now actually recording the remaining questions, so we can tap into that in the Discord event. Um, I would like to actually give uh, maybe one minute to Ian. He's also with us. He's also one of our alumni. Maybe he may want to say something. But before that, uh, I just want to share with you that if you like what you have seen today, uh, we actually are doing that every week, every Thursday in with our masterclass uh, students. So. Um, as far as we have heard from, as a feedback from the students, they really enjoyed these discussions because it's not only always uh, hearing like a code or how to uh, hands-on uh, implement on Unity. It's also like sharing and exchanging ideas. And uh, not only Roger and Dennis and mentors, our students is also like sharing a lot between each other since it's an advanced class. So we hope to see you in the other open lectures and other um, actually uh, uh, classes as well. And maybe uh, I would like to give the last words to I'm, would you like to say something to us or 
any comments regarding the things that we just discussed? I uh, can. Perfect. Uh, Hi, Ian. Hi, uh, I'm Ian McKenzie. I'm one of the alumni from the class, and I work as a software engineer at Samsung Neurologica. Um, I guess one of the pieces that I wanted to pitch in is one of the biggest, the, the interaction and the hand tracking and everything is is um, absolutely wonderful. And it, it's been a great investment in myself to learn that. But uh, very recently, one of the biggest takeaways that I've found out of this course is that, especially if you're, um, again, as was mentioned, if you're afraid of code, I definitely wouldn't take this course. But if you're already into Unity a little bit, one of the biggest benefits I've gotten from this is kind of like a mid-level Unity developer is understanding how to build these like really complex objects in Unity and how to control them in an efficient way in a way that's easy to manage and scale. So like that robotic arm is is no simple thing to put together. And um, a lot of the things that I've been working on recently um, has all come into play. I find myself going back and checking back in on the, the course content and re-referencing like what we learned in, about physics and how to set up all these these complex objects, um, especially now as I'm working on like personal projects with like vehicles and whatnot. Um, so there are other other benefits in this other than just hand tracking um, that this is a really good advanced course for people that are into Unity. One thing that Dennis posted today about UniRx and reactive programming, we haven't talked about that so much today, maybe on the Discord. Would you like to say anything about that? Is there anything uh, that you are starting to use or how would you like to implement this? Um, there are different mindsets. Um, there's not, not stuff that I've necessarily implemented uh, recently. It's more been off of the, um, just trying to create really, <laughs> but, involved more like whereas a, a lot of my previous stuff has been more like oh let's make a game and slap it together and just try to make it like work it's more of like let's try to simulate like a real object and like make it behave the way that you would expect and maybe maybe it doesn't similar to like with the colliders where you don't need to have these incredibly complex colliders but visually it'll work the same if you fill it up with boxes to make a complex collider so it, it's kind of similar of, of um mostly simulating and a little bit of faking of, of making these things work in Unity. Perfect, perfect. Thank you, Ian, for your comments. I think we have to wrap up. Anything, Roger and Dennis, would you like to share? I mean, we will see each other anyways uh, in the Discord, but. Well, yeah, just thank you everyone, especially who joined, which from our alumni, it's always really nice to see. Uh, what you have been working on and how you progress and that you still like come back to the class and actually benefit from it that makes us extremely happy um, because that's exactly why we wanted to build the class that you know you can learn something new and experiment with new things and then we get feedback like where do you struggle the most that we can fill in those gaps in case we haven't covered everything in the class that we can add additional modules for someone which is maybe not as advanced as we hope they were um, but yeah otherwise um, Check out Hand Physics Lab on the SideQuest store. It's free available to download. It's currently in this, the sandbox version. I really hope you enjoy it and provide us with feedback, what works, what doesn't work. Uh, we're always eager to hear um, what you think about it and where if you have additional ideas which you think might benefit the app, um, just let us know so we can um, try to implement all the feedbacks we get before we officially release it. Thank you a lot, Dennis and Roger. Um, we will see each other in uh, in Discord maybe in five minutes. And uh, thank you everyone again. We are planning a few interesting open lectures uh, from different uh, like researchers and speakers. So feel free to suggest any kind of topic that you would like to learn. We really want to make it as accessible as possible to everyone. So hope to see you in the next open lecture. Goodbye and have um, a great day and week with VR and AR. Bye. Thanks, everyone. Thanks, everyone.